Hello and welcome to Japan Media Tour. I'm your host, Stephen Tiem, and today we're going to analyze Juzo Itami's 1985 masterpiece, Tampopo. That's right, it's a masterpiece. The film has a star studded cast, including the likes of Ken Watanabe and Tsutomu Yamazaki. Nobuko Miyamoto plays the titular Tampopo. Miyamoto was married to Itami and also plays lead roles in several of his other films. Such as the 1987 comedy A Taxing Woman. So, Tampopo was cleverly billed as a ramen western, as it's a kind of parody of the spaghetti westerns that were made popular by Italian filmmaker Sergio Leone in the 1960s, with movies like Once Upon a Time in the West and A Fistful of Dollars. Tampopo starts with the doors of a movie theater opening. A gangster dressed in all white comes in with a woman on his arm, also all in white, him in a suit, her in a dress and lace gloves. The two of them sit down in the front row as waiters carry a table in for them, with champagne and a sumptuous banquet laid out on top. The man in the white suit immediately breaks the fourth wall, looking directly at us and saying, You're at the movies too, huh? What are you eating? He complains about people who eat chips in the theater, making annoying crackling sounds as they reach into the bag. Just then, another patron opens up a bag of chips and starts eating. The man in white tears into him, saying he'll kill him if he does that once the film starts. He then goes on and tells us about proper theater etiquette. Man, I, I gotta see this movie in the theater sometime. Watching it at home is great and all, but it's one of those ones that was just made for the cinema. So clearly he loves film and hates having movies interrupted. But he says that what he would really hate would be for the moment just before his death to be interrupted. He talks about how at that moment of death, a short film flashes before your eyes. In this film are all the important moments of your life. This is your last film. Something to sum up your entire existence. Think about that for a second. Doesn't that make you want to go out and live? The man in white says he's really looking forward to his final film. He warns the woman he's with not to interrupt his last film by saying something like, please don't die. He then informs us that our film is starting and the opening credits start to roll. By the way, the actor who plays the man in white is Koji Yaksho. Who also appears in films like Cure, Shall We Dance, and Perfect Days. So, this is just a phenomenal intro. Itami breaks the fourth wall, not just letting us into the film, but letting the cinema into our lives, into the culminating moments of our existence. His mix of humor and existentialism continues throughout the course of the movie, and I don't think anyone has really done it better than he does in Tampopo. Now, Before we get into the meat of the film, I'm going to tell you straight up there will be spoilers, so give the movie a watch if you haven't. However, this movie really is about the moments the dialogue, the humor, and the stylized performances. So, spoilers won't ruin it the same way they would Star Wars or The Sixth Sense or something. So, now the film really starts. It's raining, and two guys are driving in a truck. This is the only black and white scene in the movie. There's a shot of Tokyo, and the narrator says, One fine day, an old man and I went out for a bite. It cuts to one of the movie's many vignettes. An old man who'd studied ramen for 40 years was initiating a young man into the art of ramen. He lays out a bunch of ground rules about how to properly consume the noodle soup, including things like contemplating the ramen before eating it, savoring the aroma, And which ingredients should be eaten in which order. This sets the tone for much of the dialogue throughout the film. It's all about the details, and I think Japanese society as a whole has somewhat of an obsession with details. So that's one thing to take note of as we move forward. We're back in the truck now, and it turns out the narrator in this vignette is Ken Watanabe's character, Gun, and he was reading a book to the driver, Goro, played by Tsutomu Yamazaki. Goro wears a cowboy hat and has bullhorns mounted on the top of his truck. These are the first couple of hints that this is a parody of the Western genre. Although it actually incorporates several other genres as well, 
It's a Western parody, but that's not all that it is. So our two Japanese cowboys, Goro and Gun, pull up to Lai Lai Ramen Shop. It's still raining heavily, and they see three kids beating up a young boy in the pouring rain. They chase the hoodlums off, and it turns out the victim is the son of Tampopo, the ramen shop owner. The shop is full of gangsters. It's, it's like a saloon in a spaghetti western, or the cantina in Star Wars. By the way, there's actually a bunch of debates online about whether Star Wars is a western. It certainly employs some elements of the western genre. So as Goro and Goon enter the ramen shop, Goon says that he has a bad feeling about this. Not because of the thugs, though, like you might expect. It's actually because he thinks the ramen looks bad. The water wasn't boiling when the chef put the noodles in. Clearly, food is more important than anything else. One of the gangsters, named Pisuken, is inviting Tampopo to go with him to Paris, though he too talks down on her ramen, saying she's behind on the times. She's using Naruto, which I guess he thinks is passé. Naruto are those fish cakes with the pink swirl design on them, in case you didn't know. Goro then throws a piece of Naruto at Pisuken's face and challenges him to a fight. Importantly though, he finishes his ramen calmly before stepping outside to rumble with the goons. This movie continuously places food upon the highest pedestal. Even when danger is imminent, food is front of mind. It's the perfect film for any gourmand. I'm a food person too. You might have guessed from the recommendations I drop at the end of each episode. I'm always looking for the best places to eat. So let me know if you have any recs for me. You can comment on YouTube or tweet at me, Japan Media Tour. Anyway, after the brawl, Goro wakes up to see Tampopo's face smiling down at him in the morning light. He's forgotten what happened the previous night. Watanabe's character, Goon, then pulls up in the truck and Tampopo gets to preparing a meal, a classic Japanese breakfast, some rice, fish, and miso soup. Tampopo's son is wearing Goro's hat and trading fight stories with the cowboys. He says his dad always told him not to run. The boys are just bonding over some food while Tampopo takes care of them. The conversation turns to Tampopo's cooking. She makes good tsukemono, or Japanese pickles, but her ramen isn't that good. I guess her husband had been the ramen chef and she just took over when he died. After Goro and Goon break the news to Tampopo that her ramen isn't up to par, she asks them to train her in the art of cooking ramen. So they teach her how to run a ramen shop, not just the cooking, but also by studying the customers. Look at him. Is it the first time he's been in the shop? How did he hear about the place? Did he walk here or did he drive? Has he been drinking or is he sober? Goro asks Tampopo to contemplate these things before making ramen for each customer. It says a lot about Japanese customer service, which is light years ahead of what we get in the West. The two men are then driving away when Tampopo chases them down and asks to be their disciple. It's a very Old West type of moment. Her saying, save the ramen shop, is like someone asking a cowboy to save their town from bandits or something. So then they get serious. Goro has Tampopo doing physical training, like lifting a huge pot of water back and forth as a form of strength training relevant to her position as a ramen chef. He's clocking her speed while she prepares the ramen. It's a classic 1980s montage. This movie kind of jumps back and forth between two worlds both in content and in style. The Wild West, as I mentioned, but also Showa-era Japan, which we've discussed quite a bit in recent weeks. So that's another couple things to keep in mind as we move forward here. At one point, Goro even has Tampopo jogging, while he rides behind her on a bike with a whistle, saying things like, you'll never compete with the male chefs. And there's some conversation to be had about whether or not this movie does anything to empower women. And I think Itami's films in general do a good job of this. A taxing woman probably more so than Tom Popo, but this film too has its brief flashes, while simultaneously adhering to spaghetti western tropes of helpless women. It's a fine balance. So next we jump into another vignette, which are probably my favorite parts of the film. This one involves a group of businessmen in a private dining room at a fancy hotel restaurant. 
There's a young man who's fumbling around, dropping his briefcase, and being quietly scolded by a superior. The menu is all in French and English, and when the waiter asks what they want, the old men are pretending they understand the menu, but are actually too afraid to try and order. One man at the table is able to read it, and so of course he orders, and all the other men just start copying him and ordering the exact same dishes. They all get the sole with consomme soup and a beer. I guess this is a comment on conformity in Japan, specifically at work or in business situations. The young man who was bumbling around takes his time and is actually able to read the menu. He orders something different than the rest of them, and his superior is kicking him under the table. He gets a very complicated order, and all the other businessmen go red in the face. This is kind of like a little victory for the new era of Japan, as it had become more open to Western influences in the 1980s. Tradition was beginning to get pushed out ever so slightly as the younger generation imported ideals from around the globe. So the waiter leaves the room and the camera follows him until we eventually end up in another part of the restaurant where a group of young women are getting a Western etiquette lesson on the topic of spaghetti. Things like hold your spoon in your left hand, fork in your right, take three strands of spaghetti at a time, and eat it without making a sound. It's reminiscent of the vignette at the beginning of the film where the old man is teaching the young man about how to enjoy ramen. Spaghetti being the stand-in for Western culture and ramen for the East. Just then, from across the restaurant, we hear a slurping sound, and an old white man is leaning over his plate, slurping spaghetti. The etiquette teacher says that even the slightest sound is an absolute taboo if you're eating spaghetti abroad. Remember, this is the bubble era when Japan was ultra-rich. People wanted to be elegant and well-mannered, they wanted to travel abroad and be seen as worldly. When the teacher goes for a bite of spaghetti, all the young women lean in as close as possible to see if they can hear a sound. All the while, the foreigner is slurping voraciously. All the girls in the class then start slurping noodles loudly, and even the teacher follows suit. It's a comedic scene, but not just for the sake of being silly. It has a point to it. First off, we all want to be sophisticated and high class to do things in the proper way. I don't know how many Japanese etiquette videos I watched before moving to Japan, but once I got there, a lot of them turned out to be outdated or exaggerated versions of Japanese rules. The scene also speaks to conformity again, as well as to breaking the rules and defying convention. In a way, it's a rebellion against the orderliness of traditional Japanese society. The vignettes continue as we now follow a waiter up to a hotel room as he delivers a meal. There we find the man in white from the opening scene of the film. His lady is lying in bed, naked, and they start making love whilst incorporating food into the act. Salt, lemon, whipped cream, whatever their hearts desire. It keeps escalating, even involving live shrimp by the end. It seems perverse, but it's necessary in that this movie covers our obsession with food from every angle. Sustenance, beauty, connection, fetishization. Food is everything to us, though we rarely take the time to look at it through so many philosophical lenses. Food is immeasurably intertwined with our lives. Through the love we have for our family and through its life-sustaining power, but also through the pleasure it gives us. So next time you have a meal, make it a damn good one, and think about how lucky you are to have access to such a wide variety of flavors. More on this later. Now we're back to the primary storyline with Tampopo and Goro. They're checking out another ramen shop on a little reconnaissance mission. Goro can tell just by looking at the place that their ramen isn't that good. The chefs are talking too much, and there's too much wasted motion as they move around the kitchen. It's like he's talking about a golf swing or something. Again, it's incredible the amount of detail they go into about seemingly mundane things. This is kind of a calling card of Juzo Itami. Through his films, he's able to turn the mundane into the extraordinary. Next, they check out another shop that's run by some true ramen masters. No wasted motion. No speaking. 
The master nonchalantly inspects every bowl to see if any broth was left over. Their tour continues as they stop at another good ramen shop, where the chef is amazing at remembering everyone's orders. It's obviously meant to be a bit comical, but the film really does transport you to that spot. It's shot from behind the counter, looking out towards the customers. The master chef is calm and collected as he takes about a dozen orders. Goro struggles to remember all the orders, but Tampopo steps up and shows her skill, remembering every order. This is the first time in the film that you feel as though she might be the chosen one after all. In the next scene, a Chinese man takes Tampopo into his shop with the promise of helping her steal a ramen recipe from a noodle shop that happens to be next door to his place. It's kind of a scary scene. The guy is pushing Tampopo into the back of his shop where it's pitch black. You think maybe something bad is about to happen, but then there's a crack of light. Tampopo peers through the crack and watches the ramen chef next door as he adds the ingredients to his broth. So she steals his recipe and tries to make the broth back at her shop. It's interesting that Tampopo, portrayed by Miyamoto as such a sweet and kind woman, is not above stealing recipes if it means her shop will stay alive. It's all about survival by any means necessary. Next, one of the cooks at a rival Ramanya mentions that his shop has been there since the post-war black market days. And this was a real thing. After World War II, there was a poor rice harvest which caused the occupying Americans to import large quantities of wheat used to make noodles which were then sold by illegal vendors. The reason these shops were illegal was because the Japanese government needed to control rations during wartime. So when the rice supply was low and the government was behind on distribution, the people of Japan turned to black market vendors for survival. You may have heard of Ame Yokocho near Ueno Station in Tokyo. It's a cool shopping area under the train tracks with lots of little restaurants and izakaya. And back in the late 40s, this area was famous for black market food stalls, which were controlled by the Yakuza. You can think of it like the mafia controlling the alcohol supply in Prohibition-era USA, except with noodles instead of booze. By the way, the Yakuza still control a lot of food stalls, or yatai, in Japan, through extortion or as a means of money laundering. But that's just between us, alright? Don't tell anyone I told you that. So anyway, we got a little sidetracked there, but the ramen chef is mad because Tampopo and Goro didn't finish their soup, so he's yelling at them. He proposes a kind of challenge and says he's coming in the morning to try Tampopo's ramen to see how good it is. It's a nice play on the western movie trope of meeting at the crack of dawn for a gunfight. And again, the costumes are all subtly western cowboy style. Leather vests, cowboy hats, bandanas. Even Tampopo is wearing green gingham and an apron, reminiscent of the women in spaghetti westerns. Tampopo doesn't have the ramen ready when her rivals get there, so they become enraged. Three of them hold Goro back, and their leader grabs Tampopo by the throat and holds her head over the pot of boiling broth. Just then, Tampopo wakes up screaming, as it turns out to all be a nightmare. And in reality, she's still making the broth. She ruins the broth, throws it on the floor, and closes the shop for the day. Goro decides it's time to call in the big guns and they go to find someone referred to as Sensei. So he takes Tampopo and her son to hang out with a band of homeless vagrants sitting by a garbage fire in a local park. A nice family outing. So this Sensei character used to be a doctor, but he was too busy studying the intricacies of ramen, and his wife and manager stole his clinic from him. It's another comical scene, the homeless guys are eating some beef bourguignon they stole from the Carlton Hotel, and they're all incredibly knowledgeable when it comes to food. They say things like, the beef bourguignon is a bit burnt, but burning is always a risk with French cuisine. And, the quality of Kitaro's pork cutlets has gone downhill since they stopped sourcing the meat from Kagoshima. So yeah, the homeless crew are, ironically, a bunch of snobs and picky eaters. They talk about fine wine and how the weather affected certain vintages in particular regions of France in the early 80s. They kind of look like old school hobos too, the type that might appear in a spaghetti western. 
Tampopo's son doesn't want to eat any of that fancy food, so one of the homeless gentlemen breaks into a restaurant with him to make him some omurice. And of course, he's a really good chef and cooks it up perfectly. Itami actually used professional chefs to prepare the meals for this movie, and he even had a food stylist to make sure each dish looked extra delicious, or that it looked gross when that was necessary for the scene. This might sound like pretty basic cro- protocol these days, but he might have been the first Japanese filmmaker to take this kind of care when it came to filming food. Nowadays, we see so much delicious food on popular Instagram and TikTok accounts that we kind of just take it for granted. Just think of how delicious the ramen in Tampopo must have looked in the 1980s when people weren't as exposed to food photography as we are today. Sensei then goes with Tampopo and Goro to help them with their quest to make the perfect ramen. But before he goes, the homeless guys sing a kind of graduation song for Sensei. And they all have beautiful voices, which is really funny. They sing a traditional Japanese graduation song called Aogeba Totoshi. And it's just a wonderful rendition, really. The man in white is looking down at this scene from his window. He embraces his lady, cracks an egg, puts the yolk in his mouth, and passes it directly into hers without breaking it. Itami's food stylist, Seiko Ogawa, actually did some research to find a type of egg that would be able to withstand this without breaking too easily. So the two proceed to pass it back and forth a few times between their mouths. The yolk eventually breaks in the woman's mouth and she starts moaning orgasmically as the yolk drips from her mouth all over her dress. It's another example of the sexualization of food. We're all guilty of eating for pleasure, and this is an extension of that to quite an extreme degree. Flashback to the man in white on a pier by the ocean. A young girl comes out of the water with a haul of oysters. He buys one from her, and he cuts his lip on it as he tries to eat it. She removes it from its shell and offers for him to eat it out of her hand. The blood from his lip drips on the oyster, and he devours it like it's the best thing he's ever tasted. The girl then licks the blood off his lips passionately. Again, it's a raw and sexual scene, and probably not a coincidence that it involves oysters, a purported aphrodisiac. The actress who plays the oyster fishing girl is Yoriko Dogichi, who also appears in Kuniyoshi Kurosawa's Cure, which we looked at in an earlier episode of Japan Media Tour. She's actually in uh, Shogun as well, and she has a bunch of small roles in well-known movies and shows. The next vignette is of a man who has to go to the dentist, perhaps due to an overindulgence in sweets. He gets his teeth drilled and then proceeds to go to the park to eat some ice cream. It's hard to shake old habits. There's a little kid staring at him with a sign around his neck that reads, Don't give him any sweets, signed by his mother. The man ignores the sign and offers the kid some ice cream, and the kid eats it happily. I really love these vignettes, each one offering up a new angle from which to view our relationship with food. This time, food represents temptation or even addiction. There's beauty in it, but there's also some darkness in our relationship with what we consume. Let's keep it moving, though. We're now back at Tom Popo's ramen shop, where Sensei is teaching her the secrets of a rich and delicious broth. Itami takes us even deeper into the details here, with Sensei offering up more precise rules about ramen making. The film teaches us to see food as an art form, not only cooking food, but eating food or looking at it or even thinking about it. It all ties into the pursuit of perfection, which is a very Japanese ideal. Even when performing a mundane task, we should perform it with great care. Even a simple life gains meaning when we take the time and effort to do it well. This is why Japan has incredible food, art, and even customer service. The crew is then eating soba at a local shop when in comes an old man who is also referred to as sensei. He must be someone of importance as he has a personal driver whose name is Shohei. The old man is absolutely devouring noodles, so the crew keeps looking over at him in amazement. He finishes his meal with some mochi and starts to choke. So Tampopo shoves a vacuum cleaner down his throat and sucks out the mochi, saving the man from an indulgent death. As a thank you for saving his life, the man treats them to a meal of soft-shell turtle. 
They take a live soft shell, kill it, and drain the blood right in front of Tampopo and her crew. Tampopo screams and can't even look at the scene. And to be honest, it's not the easiest viewing. This scene might be a little disturbing, so if you're squeamish, just be ready for it. It turns out the rich man's driver, Shohei, is really good at making ramen, so the man allows Tampopo's crew to borrow him to help improve their recipe. At this point, Tampopo's ramen has improved significantly. She's making a clear shoyu broth with only roast pork, green onions, and menma, which are bamboo shoots, as toppings. She's keeping it simple. They also decide to change the name of the shop from Lai Lai to Tampopo. The job's not done yet, though. Shohei and Tampopo go around trying even more different ramen shops and snooping in the garbage to see what ingredients they use. She tricks one of the ramen shop owners to get his technique for making noodles. Again, she's trying to save her shop by any means necessary. She doesn't mind a bit of trickery. That's just business. Pisuken, one of the gangsters who used to hang out at Lai Lai Ramen, shows up again and confronts Goro. He feels bad that his gang jumped Goro the first time they fought, so he proposes a one-on-one -on -one bout. They fight under a bridge and they beat the crap out of each other until they both collapse on the ground, exhausted. Pisuken then asks Goro if he's in love with Tampopo, to which he replies that he's just helping her to get her ramen shop back on its feet. Pisuken reveals that he's a contractor specializing in interior design, and so he joins the crew to give the shop a makeover. Not just the shop, they actually end up giving Tampopo herself a makeover. They dress her up like a French chef with a tall white hat, a toque blanche, and put some makeup on her. And Goro is smitten. He says she looks like something out of a French film. And based on some of the dialogue and sexual themes in this movie, I'd say Juzo Itami has seen his fair share of French films. Then Pisuken's crew dressed Tampopo up in a red and black polka dot dress, like some sort of 80s party girl or something. Goro, of course, is still dressed like a cowboy. So the two of them go out for Korean barbecue, and Goro asks why she works so hard. Tampopo explains that everyone has a ladder. Some try to climb to the top, while others don't even realize they have a ladder. Then she tells Goro he helped her find her ladder. He helped her to realize her potential. Goro asks what her husband was like. She says he was a good man, but he liked to drink and he was always in a hurry. Goro tells her that his wife left with the kids. He grew up in a miserable family and so he wanted a warm home to call his own one day. But he was never able to get that. It's raining after dinner and Tampopo says, It was raining the night I met you. Kind of a romantic cliché, but I, I like that line for some reason. It's a bit reminiscent of the old French films Itami deftly slipped into our consciousness. The two of them go back to the ramen shop and Tampopo runs Goro a bath. He uses her brush on his hair and she lays out some dry clothes for him. It's a little taste of the warm home he'd always wished for. Some more vignettes follow including one that takes place at a restaurant where an old man is eating some Peking duck. It's a professor having dinner while he talks business with a kind of sketchy-looking man, some, some type of gangster. They're talking about an investment opportunity. The Tohoku University professor is explaining that he doesn't have much in the way of savings, and clearly the gangster is trying to take advantage of him. The gangster goes to use the phone and explains to whoever's on the other end that they need to have the car ready behind the bank for when the old man withdraws everything he's got. He says he's a real sucker. Meanwhile, the professor is reaching into the gangster's jacket pocket and stealing money from his snakeskin wallet. Just then, a cop slaps handcuffs on the old man and asks if he's all up to his old professor scam again. The fake professor asks if he can have one more bite of his meal before he gets hauled down to the station. It makes you think of the last meals of prisoners on death row. What's the final thing you want before you pass over into the spirit realm? A good meal. A good meal is like a ceremony, a spiritual experience, whether it's your birthday or your last day on earth. The next scene starts with someone sprinting by with a panicked look on his face. He's running through the dark streets until he arrives at an apartment. He gets inside and his wife is on the floor dying, with the kids gathered around, and a doctor and a nurse tending to her. 
The husband tells her she can't die. He then tells her she needs to cook dinner. It's like if she does this, she'll stay alive. Making meals for her family is her raison d'etre, her ikigai. She's so pale, she gets up slowly and makes her way to the kitchen, doubled over. She starts chopping vegetables with speed and precision, like someone who's been cooking their whole life. She quickly whips up some chahan, fried rice, for the family, and the husband shovels it down, loving every bite. The wife smiles and collapses to the floor. The doctor checks her pulse and announces her time of death as 9.22. The man cries and his children scream, but he tells his kids to keep eating. It's the last meal your mother cooked. Eat it while it's hot. What an amazing line. It's profound, and this scene is dark comedy at its finest. It's funny, but it's also heartbreaking. It makes you contemplate the connection between food and those we share it with. So think about that the next time you eat a great meal with someone you care about. Just imagine, though, the last meal someone ever cooks for you before they die. What a scene. Meanwhile, Tampopo is close to perfecting her ramen with the help of Pisken, who it turns out is also quite the ramen chef. She's mastered the broth and he recommends his favorite toppings, thinly sliced pork and green onion, stir fried and placed atop the ramen with some sesame oil. Tampopo ramen is starting to get busy and her rival's shop is now empty as she's stolen all of their business. Her squad rolls up to a restaurant for the final tasting, looking like a group of outlaws from the Old West. There's a drumbeat playing that's reminiscent of an intense scene in a Kurosawa movie or something. By the way, this movie owes a lot to the legendary Akira Kurosawa. Tampopo is a parody of a spaghetti western, but Leone's films were heavily influenced by the works of Kurosawa, most notably Yojimbo which A Fistful of Dollars is essentially a copy of. In Yojimbo, a samurai played by Toshiro Mihune happens by a town where two factions are vying for control. Very similar to Clint Eastwood showing up in San Miguel in Leone's 1964 film. Search up the legal disputes between the two if you're interested, but Leone pretty much copied Kurosawa's film. So all the men are eating Tampopo's ramen without saying a word as the camera scans their faces from left to right, then right to left again. The room is dark until all the men hold up their bowls to drink the broth at the end and the sun starts shining upon them. Triumphant horn music begins to play and the men give Tampopo her congratulations. She'd done it. She'd become a ramen master. Tears of joy are streaming down Tampopo's face. Outside in the rain, we see the gangster in the white suit get shot multiple times. He staggers through a walkway and into a playground where he's shot one last time and collapses, his white suit drenched with blood. His woman runs over and grabs him, crying out for him to hold on as he gasps for his last breath. He says to her, Did I ever tell you about hunting wild boar in winter? There's nothing for the boar to eat, so they root for yams. All they eat are yams. When a hunter shoots one, he has to quickly slit its belly, pull out the guts, and grill them over a fire. The translation says yams, but what he's talking about are yamaimo, or mountain potatoes, which have a sticky sort of texture to them. He continues, The intestines of the boar are stuffed with yamaimo, yamaimo sausages. Grill them, slice them, eat them hot. It sounds good, right? She replies, yes, perfect with soy sauce and wasabi. It's as dramatic and beautiful as it is funny, which pretty much sums up this film in its entirety. As the man lies back, fading away, he says, I wanted so much to eat them with you. She screams that they will eat them together. Please don't die. He calmly shushes her and puts his white hat on her head and says, my final movie is starting, as he stares at the sky with rain pooling in his eyes. He dies with a smile and a completely satisfied look on his face, like life was worth it for that final film. Again, what a scene. It makes you want to live a life interesting enough to result in a good last film that you can watch as you die. So make sure you capture some great scenes with your eyes as your life goes on, 
I can't say enough about the dialogue in this film. It's perfect. Tampopa's shop undergoes a renovation and comes out neat, clean, and white with copper pans and a light-colored wooden countertop. All the loose ends are being tied up. Tampopo's son, Tabo, is now friends with the kids who bullied him before. The professor says that, in all honesty, he never thought a woman would make a good ramen chef, but now he sees how wrong he was. Maybe this says something about the Showa era as women began to enter the workforce more and more at that time. Customers then start pouring in, including a few familiar faces. The music playing now is just like something triumphant from the end of a cowboy movie. Goro steps out into the street, lights up a cigarette, and looks around to see the crew all going their separate ways, each on their own horse. The professor on a bicycle, Gun in the truck, Shohei in the rich guy's fancy car. Goro gets into the truck and starts driving off. Pisuken runs alongside for a moment, not wanting him to leave, but... Cowboys always leave at the end of the movie. That's just how it goes. The credits begin to roll, and there's a woman breastfeeding her baby on a bench. The camera slowly zooms in on the scene until we're right up close to the nipple. Honestly, it's the perfect ending to a film about food. The first meal we ever eat. What a masterpiece. This film effortlessly blends together numerous genres and incorporates themes that would generally seem to be worlds apart. In a movie that's ostensibly about a ramen shop, Itami manages to delve deep into topics as diverse as food, wealth, class, love, sex, death, and family. It's incredible how he's able to reveal so many hidden truths about food through the examination of seemingly ordinary subject matter. Man, I love this movie, and if you haven't seen it, please do. It's not too late. Now stay tuned for this week's bonus topic. So today I just wanted to talk about some of the different varieties of ramen found in Japan, some of which you'll be familiar with and some you may not be. The most famous regional type of ramen is probably Hakata ramen from Fukuoka. You might know it better by the name Tonkotsu ramen. The broth is made by cooking down pork bones until it comes out rich and creamy. The noodles are generally thin when compared to some other types of ramen, but this depends on the shop to some degree. Ichiran and Ippudo are both chains specializing in Tonkotsu ramen and both have locations all over Japan, and all over the world for that matter. Next up is Hokkaido's miso ramen. The broth is made using miso paste, along with other ingredients such as pork and garlic. Miso ramen is hearty and is sometimes served with butter to add extra richness on a cold winter's day. Onomichi ramen is a variety that, of course, comes from its namesake Onomichi, a small city in Hiroshima Prefecture, on the Seto Inland Sea. The broth is made with fresh seafood, along with soy sauce, chicken, and pork. The noodles are often thin and flat, and the key topping is a nice juicy piece of pork back fat. Fun fact, Onomichi is also the hometown of the old couple in Ozu's Tokyo Story. While the west coast of Japan is known for heavy bowls of tonkotsu ramen, The East is all about the lighter shoyu, or soy sauce, which is actually Japan's original variety of ramen, the type you'd find in a post-war yatai in Tokyo. That being said, most people think of Yokohama as the birthplace of ramen in Japan. Yokohama is home to the Shin Yokohama Ramen Museum, and it also has its own regional style called Ieke ramen, meaning home-style ramen which is essentially a mix of tonkotsu and shoyu. Ieke ramen tends to have somewhat shorter noodles than other varieties of ramen. Now, for those of us who love garlic, you'll want to head to Kumamoto to eat black ramen, which is essentially tonkotsu ramen infused with blackened garlic. It's rich, it's heavy, and it's delicious. There's about a million other varieties of ramen in Japan, including Taiwan ramen, which I recommended in our episode on Akira Toriyama, 
but I just thought I'd give a quick rundown on some of the best and most popular varieties. Now stay tuned for this week's recommendation. I hope you're not sick of hearing about ramen at this point, because of course today's recommendation is a ramen shop. Soba House Konjiki Hototogisu is one of the most well-known and well-respected ramenya in Japan. And up until recently, it was one of only three ramen shops in the world to have a Michelin star. And just to be clear, it's not like it lost its star because it couldn't contend with the other ramen shops. As of right now, April 2024, there are zero ramen shops on the planet with a Michelin star. Being that ramen is one of the most delicious things in the world, I'm not sure how much stock we need to put into those stars anyway. So Konjiki Hototogisu is located in Shinjuku, in an alley just north of the Shinjuku Gyoen National Garden. Their signature broth is made from pork, dashi, and clams, topped with a seasoned egg, thinly sliced chashu pork, and green onions. They add a truffle sauce and porcini oil for extra depth, and the flavors play off each other perfectly. This is the only ramen I've had there, so I can't speak for the others, but a lot of people seem to love their shio ramen, which uses the finest Okinawan and Mongolian salt to create a more pure and simple flavor. It's also got some other unique ingredients like pancetta and Inca berry sauce, making it a one-of-a-kind experience, I'm sure. Maybe next time I'll get it and give you an update. It's hard not to go for the shoyu again, though, since it was so good the first time. Wait times depend on the day and time. I went on a rainy weekday and waited for about 30 minutes or so. It wasn't too bad at all. Of course, I finished every last drop of the precious broth, and I will be going back, Michelin star or not. By the way, the other two ramen spots that had Michelin stars were Tsuta and Nakiryu in Tokyo. I haven't been to either, but I'm sure they're good, so maybe check those out as well. So that's the recommendation for this week. Apologies if it's the first thing that pops up when you search ramen in Japan on Google, but I had to recommend a delicious ramen for the Tampopo episode, and Konjiki Hototogisu seemed like a fail-proof option. As always, you can find a link to the recommendation in the episode description on YouTube or Spotify or whatever platform you're using. All right, so... That's all for today. I had a lot of fun talking about Tampopo, and I'm glad I got to rewatch it for this podcast. That's another thing about this movie. It has tremendous rewatch value. Next week, we'll be talking about Pokemon. I think I'll just stick to the first generation of games, as there's way too much to cover, but I'll definitely do more Pokemon episodes in the future. I grew up on the games, as I'm sure a lot of you did, so... It's got a place in my heart. Really looking forward to that one. Anyway, that's it for today. This is Stephen TM signing off, and I'll see you next time for Pokemon. <laughs>